Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In our opening podcast, Professor Sir Hugh Strawn explains why he organised the conference. I'm Hugh Strawn. I'm Professor of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. In 2018, I had the privilege of organising a conference on the British Home Front in the First World War for the centenary. My motivation in organising the conference was twofold. The first concern I had was that much that surrounded the centenary was not actually advancing knowledge. It was more about propagating existing knowledge. Public education has been a big part of what the centenary has accomplished. And as a teacher of military history, a historian of the First World War, that has been an extraordinarily exciting process to be part of. But also we should acquire new knowledge as a result of the centenary. We should be more aware of current research, which so many academics are doing, not only, of course, in the United Kingdom, but further afield. In many respects, the official commemorations have not given those voices the space and the opportunity which I think they have deserved, and which in many ways will be the real legacy of the First World War centenary, because that will carry on beyond 2018 into the 2020s and continue to debates for years to come. My second concern was that the centenary commemorations in Britain have naturally enough focused on the dead. We have tended as communities to gather around war memorials to mark battles and their centenaries. And at those events, we have thought about people overwhelmingly in uniform, members of the army, the navy, and after 1918, the air force. That leaves out the rest of the British community. This war is often described as a total war. That was not a phrase regularly used in the First World War itself. But it is a phrase that comes out of the war and reflects the idea that in the mobilisation necessary to fight a war on a global scale, to put a mass army into the field in Europe, you have to engage the whole of society. Military activity directly doesn't remain solely a male activity. It embraces women with the formation of uniformed women services. And it embraces those who are not in uniform, regardless of gender, in all sorts of occupations, ranging from the civil service to industrial production, from farming to forestry. And it is those people whose constant efforts throughout a four-year-plus period seem to me to have been neglected as we've thought about their centenary. They're all either directly or indirectly supporting the war effort. We think very often of those making munitions, particularly of women in munitions factories. Their military contribution is self-evident. The shells they produce are going to the battlefront to kill the Germans. But the single mother, effectively, she may have lost her husband, she may still have a husband, but he's absent. She has to raise a family solo. She receives extra payment through separation allowances, but she's sustaining an emotional burden as the mother And an emotional burden, too, in connecting the absent father with the family that she is rearing and responsible for. That is so self-evident that we tend not to think about it as we stand in front of war memorials and read the names of famous regiments. It very rarely involved loss of life. Some women, and we're talking, of course, overwhelmingly about women in that context, were killed in the war by enemy action. Some were killed in factory explosions and in accidents, and some may well have been caught up in the influenza epidemic of 1918. What we're talking about, broadly speaking, is a community that survives but suffers. And it's that suffering and that readiness to commit to the war effort, that suppression, if you like, of an individual need to a collective need, which I think we've tended to forget about. The purpose of this conference is to make clear that the armed forces are the tip of a spear, but there is a whole nation behind them. And that nation is rallying to the cause. The brief to the speakers 
was that they should concentrate on the United Kingdom as it was in 1914. When Britain went to war, it did so as an empire. And when it came out of that war, it was an even bigger empire. There is a story to be told about the British home front, which is a British imperial home front, to explore the links, particularly to what were then called the White Dominions. People in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and Canada who regarded themselves just as much British as they did Australian, New Zealand, Canadian or South African. But the logistics of that and the quantity of material that that would have involved would have been enormous. So the focus remained on the United Kingdom. That, in 1914, includes what is today the Republic of Ireland. So Ireland, north and south as it is now, Scotland, Wales and England. In thinking nationally for the United Kingdom, we were also very conscious of the need to think locally. Much of the war is disseminated at local level through newspapers, through patriotic organisations, through bodies like military service tribunals that administer conscription. So there is a dialogue going on between London, in simplified terms, and the rest of the country, with the rest of the country very often taking independent and different positions. And we wanted to capture some of the texture of that. The origins of the conference on the British home front in the First World War lie in the Scottish panel set up to commemorate the centenary. When I expressed some of my concerns about the neglect of the home front and the need for greater academic activity, Professor Norman Drummond, who is chair of the Scottish panel, responded with alacrity. Fortunately, Professor Louise Richardson, who was then the principal and vice-chancellor of St Andrews University, seized on this opportunity and welcomed the idea that her university, as it then was, should be the host for the conference. The Scottish government responded by putting in the funding that could get us underway. And what was extraordinarily gratifying was that the United Kingdom responded similarly with an identical matching amount channeled through the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. That put us very firmly in business and it enabled us to be really quite ambitious in the programme that we produced. We have been very keen, and both governments were also keen, that we should disseminate the results of that conference as widely as possible. There is a tendency when you organise an academic conference to see the output as an academic output, a volume of conference papers, and indeed that will be one output from this conference. But podcasts provide an opportunity to spread the word much more widely and in a much more accessible fashion. We are delighted that the 1926 Foundation and John Cawthorn have funded these podcasts and so made them available for free distribution, not only to schools, but to the general public, and not only nationally here in the United Kingdom, but also internationally. You have been listening to The British Home Front in the First World War. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. Do join us for our next podcast when we hear from Professor Katrina Pennell about the United Kingdom in 1914.